Before we get into how to make fittings and deal with pipe hangers, some tips on proper use of contact adhesive to make tight joints. Most of these adhesives are flammable, so no smoking or sparks around them. You must always stir them well. Some have a brush in the lid, and others open just like paint cans, and you can use a stiff, short bristle brush of your choice. To keep the adhesive from drying out and having a handy place to keep the brush, cut a donut from a piece of scrap sheet. Poke your knife through the center and push the brush handle in the slit. Pipe hangers are a part of nearly every job and they require special treatment to keep the weight of the pipe from compressing the insulation. But this simple technique will keep this from happening. Use wooden dowel plugs to cut to length of the insulation thickness. Make a hole cutter from a piece of tubing slightly smaller than the outside diameter of the dowel and file some teeth into one end. Cut a hole at the spot where the hanger falls. Brush adhesive in the hole. Push the plug in. Center on the hanger. On larger pipes, use two more plugs spaced about four and eight o'clock. This will keep the heavier pipe from teetering on a single plug, as illustrated in the cutaway. So much for hangers. Now we're going to learn how to make fitting covers. On most jobs, you'll find one fitting for every four feet of pipe. They can be all types, elbows, tees, valves, couplings, unions, reducers, and many more. A 90 degree threaded elbow has a thick body and shoulders. When nesting or sleeving with pipe insulation, you make the covers using the miter box by cutting 45 degree pieces and adhering them together. Slit down the throat side, apply adhesive and install. Make each leg long enough to overlap the adjoining insulation at least one inch. Force the brush into the overlap seam to seal. For larger size elbows up to four inch pipe size, you can make insulation covers from mitered sections of pipe insulation or from sheet insulation. With sheet, you can insulate larger L's and T's than four inch. It's especially easy with welded L's. Some manufacturers supply templates or application guides for cutting half sections, then adhering them together at the edges and snapping over the fitting or they can be laid out by hand. If you don't have a template, use charts supplied by the manufacturer to lay out the cuts or do it yourself by measuring the fitting throat to get the inside radius, R1. Wrap a strip of foam sheet around the pipe to get the circumference. Mark and cut off. Do not stretch it. Set your dividers or tape measure to the R1 radius and mark off this distance on the sheet. Then make a mark at one half the strip length and place that mark on the R1 radius and mark the end. This will be radius two. Using the dividers or tape, scribe the radiuses off on the sheet. Cut out one half and use this as a template to mark the other. Cut out and join as before. With your sharp knife, cut out two half sections from the sheet. Place the smooth skin surfaces together and brush adhesive on the long seam. Let dry. Cut the ends off straight. You can use a strip of sheet metal as a guide. Always insulate fittings like these first before the straight pipe. There are three simple ways to make tees. The three-piece tees, chisel point, and lastly, the saddle method should be used for concealed work only. You insulate small valves by butting the insulation up to the valve shoulders, then wrap the valve body with foam insulation tape to the thickness of the adjoining insulation. Cut a nesting size of insulation to enclose the valve 
and foam wrap. Make cutouts to go around the packing nut, apply adhesive, and install as usual. For larger valves and flanges, insulate with sheet material. Cut donuts the same diameter as the flanges and install at pipe flanges. Use your dividers to mark off on the sheet and carefully cut them out. Keep the knife square with the cutting surface. Insulating a flange valve is done by insulating three flanges and one valve body. Use scrap strips of sheet to build the body of the valves shown previously. Wrap a strip of sheet around the flange to measure the length of sheet to cover the flange. Do not stretch the strip. Apply adhesive to the edge of the flange donut. The inside seam of the cover, place in position and press all joints firmly together. Once you know how to insulate flanges and valves, other fittings like these can be done the same way, using your skills to cut and fit the insulation to the fitting shapes. Sheet insulation is also used for insulating flat or curved surfaces such as ducts, tanks, and vessels. The best way to insulate ducts is to cut the bottom piece first, making it the same width as the duct. Cut the side pieces so they extend over the edges of the bottom insulation, and then the top so it extends over the side pieces. To form a watershed, apply adhesive with a brush or roller to the duct surface, leaving a one-half inch wide uncoated border at the butt edge seams. Allow to dry to touch, but still tacky under slight pressure. Position the sheet so it overlaps the edges of the previously installed sheet by one eighth inch. Hold it in position and spot adhere it to the center. Compress the butt edges into place for a tight joint with adjoining sheets. Spread the joint and apply adhesive to both butt edges. Do not flood with adhesive. Align carefully for good appearance and apply pressure to the joint. Standing seams can be insulated with scrap strips of sheet stock or with half sections of pipe insulation with mitered corners. If ducts or any other flat or curved surface or insulated piping is located outdoors, it should be protected with a protective coating, brushed or roller coated. For best appearance, apply two coats. When the job calls for foam insulation, all you need is a sharp knife and your now sharpened skills to work with this efficient insulation. Make sure all seams and joints are tightly sealed and the insulation covers completely. It's easy when you know how. This instructional video was produced